Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Well, this is Budget Day in Canada. We have details on how much of a deficit our country will be running, along with reaction. The Alberta government announced more funding for housing providers to help with rising inflation. And we hear from Release International about how Christian leaders are being tortured and even killed in Russian-occupied Ukraine. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The federal budget was tabled today by Finance Minister Christian Freeland, and it doesn't appear as though it'll be balanced anytime soon. Freeland says Canada will be running around a $40 billion deficit. Now, spending this year will increase by $37.1 billion from $492.5 to $534.6 billion. The budget also increases capital gains taxes. Now, even though National Pharmacare, $10 a day daycare, a National Food School Program, and the disability benefit were discussed, a large focus was on building more homes. Finance Minister Freeland says her government is committed to helping to build 4 million homes by the year 2031 to help solve the housing crisis. She says her government will be cutting federal taxes on new home construction and making more government land available for building homes. She says for first-time home buyers, the government will also be extending the amortization period to 30 years for mortgages on new home builds, which will help more young Canadians afford their first home. As for the carbon tax rebate checks, Freeland says the government will provide more than $2.5 billion in rebate checks to around 600,000 small and medium-sized businesses across the country. So what does all of this mean for the average Canadian? Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly gave us his thoughts and if there were any surprises in Budget 2024. Surprises on both the spending and the taxation side. We know this is a big spending government. They always put out projections, oh, we'll spend this much, and then they overshoot it. They spend more and more each year. Program spending is up $30 billion over last year. Last year, program expenses were $450 billion. This year, they're $480 billion. The deficit is going to be $25 billion more than they projected in last year's um, uh, budget over the coming five years. They're just, instead of the budget deficit going down, it's going back up again. And then you've got the interest charges on the deficit. This is the one I always say, it's like paying just a uh, monthly minimum on your credit card, $54 billion this year. That's more than the federal government sends to the provinces and territories for healthcare. And it's more than they collect in the GST how. So that's the spending side, it's crazy. They claim they're gonna pay for this by increasing the capital gains tax uh, from 50% inclusion to 66% for corporations on any capital gain, and they'll do that the same for any individual making 250,000 in capital gains. That's gonna really hit businesses, business owners, small, medium, large. They're just gonna stop investing in Canada because the reward won't be there. Uh, they claim it's gonna bring in six and a half billion this year, 20 billion over the next four years. I don't think they're gonna meet those targets, and I think it's going to really hurt the economy. This is not a budget built to get the Canadian economy back on track. Now, the Canadian Tax Press Federation was also not very impressed with Minister Freeland's budget. Chris Sims, the Alberta director of the CTF, says the feds will be hiking taxes, increasing spending, and allowing debt interest charges to simply be out of control. And I really wanted to alert folks about this. So we are now, you, dear taxpayer, are now spending more than a billion dollars per week on the interest charges on the debt. So the federal debt, the entire debt, is now more than $1 trillion. To put that number into perspective, if you started counting loonies right now, it would take you 30,000 years to count to a $1 trillion. That's how much trouble we're in. That's how much debt we're in. We have to pay interest on that trillion dollars. And now that interest costs us more than what we spend on health care in Canada. Higher fuel prices helped push the annual inflation rate higher in March. It rose from 2.8 to 2.9%, largely due to a 4.5% increase in gasoline prices. Now, excluding gas, the inflation rate was actually 2.8%. The Bank of Canada's three core measures for inflation for March also moved lower compared to February. Analysts say if core inflation continues to cool, however, we could finally see an interest rate cut by Canada's central bank sometime in June. 
Well, it was cool and soggy today, as we saw rain mixed with snow here in southwestern Alberta. Jeanette Rocher is in now with a quick peek at the forecast. Jeanette, how long is the wet stuff supposed to last? Yeah, well, we could see some more light snow beginning this evening and then another two centimeters on a Wednesday, as well as a 30 to 50 K wind both tonight and tomorrow and an overnight. Uh, we're looking at wind chill of minus 10 overnight and in the morning, but then a daytime high on Wednesday of three degrees before things start to clear up Wednesday evening for some nice uh, sunshine on a Thursday. And I'll be back later in the show to tell you all about that. Great. Thanks so much, Jeanette. An Israeli drone strike on a car in southern Lebanon killed a commander with the terrorist group Hezbollah. Ismail Yusuf Baz was reportedly killed in a drone strike which specifically targeted his car. The attack also injured three others. The IDF confirmed it carried out the strike, saying it targeted the commander of Hezbollah's coastal region. Israeli military officials say Baz, whose rank is equal to a brigade commander, was a senior and veteran official in the military wing of Hezbollah. The reports that more Christian leaders are being killed, tortured, and disappearing in occupied parts of Ukraine. And according to Release International in Russia, priests who oppose Putin's invasion are also being imprisoned and silenced. We have more now on this report by Andrew Boyd from the UK-based Release International. In February, the body of a Ukrainian Orthodox priest was found in the streets of Russian-occupied Kherson. He was 59-year-old Stepan Podolchak, According to his bishop, Russian military forces had tortured him to death. Father Podolchak was hauled away barefoot with a bag over his head, say Norway-based Forum 18. His bruised body was later found in the street. According to some reports, he'd been shot in the head. Churches that are not Russian Orthodox face persecution and many have been closed. Some priests have been deported, others have disappeared. Father Podolchak had been pressured to desert the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and join the Russian Orthodox Church instead. Despite the danger, he chose to remain with his congregation under Russian occupation. He's been described as faithful to God, pure in soul, honest and just. Other church leaders have suffered the same fate. In November 2023, Pentecostal deacon Anatoly Prokopchuk and his 19-year-old son Alexander were kidnapped and shot in Kherson. Their mutilated bodies were found four days later in Woodland. And in Russia, Christians have been jailed for refusing to take the Putin line. It's reported that 300 priests signed a petition condemning his invasion. Yet, despite the growing oppression, God is at work in the conflict. Pastor Alexander Salfetnikov was tortured by the Russians. He managed to escape with his wife to an area still under Ukrainian control. There, his new church is filled to capacity. Most are non-believers. At one service, 30 came forward to give their lives to Jesus. 30 more responded to the gospel at another service nearby. Release International's associate says people flock to the Word of God and convert to Christ, in whom they find their only hope in the conflagration of war. Wow, that's incredible. The Alberta government announced more funding help for housing providers to help combat rising costs and inflation. Seniors Community and Social Services Minister Jason Nixon says an extra $21 million will be given to housing providers to help with rising day-to-day -day expenses. This is an increase of nearly 40% compared to Budget 2023 and will bring the total funding up to approximately $75 million in Budget 24-25. This funding will be distributed to all housing providers across the province that operate family and community housing. Our housing providers will be able to put this money to use in supporting their hardworking staff, covering utilities and routine maintenance, and addressing costs associated with, with unit t uh, turnover, processing applications and managing wait lists. These are critical operations and services that we simply cannot put on the back burner. By ensuring operations run smoothly, we can assure that vulnerable and low-income Albertans have access to affordable places to call home. A Lethbridge nonprofit organization was honored with an award from our province's Seniors, Community and Social Services Minister. BCN's Naveen Day has that story. 
Greenacres Foundation in Lethbridge was recognized by Seniors, Community and Social Services Minister Jason Nixon with the Minister's Senior Service Award in the nonprofit category. Chair for the Foundation Jeff Carlson says Greenacres Foundation was recognized for their programs that are being adopted across the province. Our entire board and, and our administration, we're thrilled because we know the amazing uh, service this provides in our community. In fact, uh, the government is now looking at putting it out throughout the entire province uh, because it's been such a success here. So we were proud to be recognized, also proud to sort of be innovators that are, are sort of piloting programs that the rest of the province can take. Greenacres Foundation received the award for their work in their Safe Suite program, which was created in partnership with the Lethbridge Elder Abuse Response Network, or LEARN. Through this partnership, they are able to provide safe accommodations for seniors experiencing or at risk of experiencing some sort of abuse. CEO of Greenacres Foundation Donna Koslovi explains why it was important for them to get the LEARN program off the ground. For seniors, um, they don't have anywhere else to go. For seniors, they, it's a time where they're feeling frightened. They um, kind of think to themselves, why me, if it's happening to them? So we thought, well, let's offer housing in a safe environment with other peers, people their own age, um, with similar likes, dislikes, you know, they can do the activities. And that gives the social workers enough time to get uh, the residents' affairs in order. Greenacres Foundation is a non-profit housing management body established by the province. They have more than 20 locations across southern Alberta. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe says his government should be able to reach a deal with the province's Teachers Federation. Talks resumed on Tuesday in a long-running labour dispute involving classroom sizes and supports for students with high needs. The teachers have been without a collective bargaining agreement since August and have staged a number of job actions to back their demands. Well, grad season is just around the corner, and that sometimes can mean big purchases for both mom and dad. But as BCN's Jeanette Rocher explains now, one nonprofit group is once again helping students suit up for the big day without breaking the bank. If you've ever had to shop for formal wear, like a grad or a prom, you know just how high the prices of dresses and suits have gotten these days. Not to mention all the added accessories like shoes, jewelry, purses. And when it's an outfit you know you'll only wear once, it makes the purchase that much harder to bear. But what if we told you there's a place right here in town where you can shop till your heart's content and it's all free? Enter the Cinderella Project and Tux Shop. Tanya Lister is the project coordinator. So the Cinderella Project is a program that was designed to step in and uh, meet a need that we saw in our community. Uh, we discovered that there are children uh, in our city who were choosing not to attend their grade 12 graduations because they weren't able to afford um, formal wear to be able to fit in with their peers. And um, yeah, that's, so the Cinderella Project and Tuck Shop was born. Providing a boutique-like experience for the students, families must register, and a one-hour appointment time is set up just for them one-on-one -on -one with a personal shopper. And they're able to come in with um, family members or bring a friend or a support worker. Lister explains that all the items in the boutique are donated, most are used, some are new, and all are free. So from the students, usually the reaction is surprise. Um, they're not sure what to expect. Um, often when they come in for their appointment, they are a little bit nervous or a little bit hesitant. Um, and it's really a cool space to see the confidence um, grow in them as they, as, they, as they go throughout, just throughout the appointment. For the parents, we just, uh, yeah, we just see relief and, and often gratitude as well because um, this was something they didn't know was gonna be able to happen, right? Um, and so we wanna be able to relieve that burden from from them so that they're able to celebrate and um, enjoy grad alongside of the, with their child. The project began eight years ago through My City Care, a nonprofit clothing bank. So there's lots of different ways that um, people in our local community can partner with My City Care. Um, we are always looking for um, for monetary donations to help us with um, costs associated with running a program. Um, so for Cinderella Project, we have um, running costs as well as um, we also take care of alteration. 
decorations for the uh, for these students' outfits. Um, we're also looking for donations of uh, grad dresses and especially men's suits and men's dress shoes are two items that we definitely need uh, donated into our space for this year. Um, this program is to bring confidence and dignity and respect to these students so that they can move forward into their next steps feeling confident in the hard work that they've put into this and just their best. Yeah, there's been tears in here for sure. <laughs> for Bridge City News, I'm Jeanette Roche. A unique hockey game is taking place in Chestermere just outside of Calgary. The Hockey Marathon for the Kids is a fundraiser for the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation. And so far, over a million dollars has been raised. Now to chat about this marathon hockey game in more detail is the founder and organizer, also one of the players participating in the event, Alex Hallett. So Alex, how long have the two teams been playing hockey nonstop for and how many goals have been scored so far? We've been playing for about 259 hours, believe it or not. We're, uh, we're trying to achieve and we will achieve a goal of 262 hours which is going to break our previous record of 261 hours, uh, all in hopes of raising funds for the Alberta Children's Hospital and uh, pediatric cancer research. Now, the hockey marathon for kids wraps up later tonight at the Chestermere Recreation Centre. How many bags of ice have you guys used so far on the players? I mean, some of the players must really be hurting right now. I couldn't even begin to tell you how many thousands of pounds of ice have been used. Uh, these players have gone through so much. We're talking players that have blown uh, tendons in their feet, nails have come out. Blown knees, hips, groins, abs. Um, you know, I, I couldn't. I couldn't speak highly enough of the players in this game. I know the average player will play anywhere from 16, well, 14 to 16 hours a day. Uh, if there's an injury, they can go upwards of 18 hours a day. And you know, give you an idea, the average player consumes about 20,000 calories a day and will lose about two pounds a day. And you know, if you ask these players, would you do it again? They'll probably play another 10 days if it means it saves the life of another child. Um, so it just it shows you the commitment. You know, the most important part of this event, you know, we talk about the players, it's nearly 2,300 volunteers to pull this event off. So it's, it's truly a community event. The players are one thing, but it's uh, the 2,300 other people that have joined in and, and helping run this event from bench liaisons to scorekeepers to referees to, to folks that cook our food and do our laundry. It's a lot of volunteers and a lot of laundry. Now, you've raised more than a million dollars so far. Have officials at the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation explained what the biggest needs are right now? No, uh, not so much. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, the funds are going to, to pediatric cancer research. And, you know, the one thing I've noticed from the first game we did in 2012 to, to, to now 2024 is the amount of kids we've met with cancer throughout the game. So, you know, every dollar we raise will go towards pediatric cancer research and in hopes of trying to save the life of a child. Thanks so much for your time today, Alex. Alex Hallett is the founder and organizer of the Hockey Marathon for the Kids. Thanks so much for joining us today from Chestermere. By the way, donations to help support the kids can be made online by visiting the website hockeymarathon.com. Well, it looked and felt a little bit like hockey weather earlier today in many parts of southwestern Alberta. We received a bit of snow, but it may not be sticking around too much longer. Full weather details are coming up. Well, it cooled off considerably today in Lethbridge. In fact, we even saw some of the white stuff once again. Jeanette Rocher is in now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, the moisture is always welcomed, but it may not be sticking around very long. Well, hell, we are seeing some light showers this morning with light flurries and then into tomorrow, another two centimeters of snow. After that, though, it should be clearing up a bit. So high of three degrees on Wednesday, up to four on Thursday. There's that sunshine. And then mainly cloudy skies for us on Friday uh, with a high of one degree seven for a high on uh, Saturday with, there with clear skies. And then we are seeing a 60% chance of showers again on Sunday with high of 11, though. And then we're getting back up to those teen temperatures as we get into the work week next week. With the partly cloudy skies there for Monday. So uh, the average high for this time of year is a 13, average low minus 130. Can you believe that? That was our temperature on this day back in 1984. That would be nice. Minus 11 was where we were sitting back in 1953 on this day. So that was the record low. Sun rose this morning at 635. Sunset this evening at 828. So we are about seven minutes shy of 14 hours of daylight. So 13 hours and 53 
minutes. Wow, four minutes longer than yesterday. 14 for a high in Victoria tomorrow. Nice, clear, sunny one on the West Coast tomorrow. Both Victoria and Vancouver seeing sunshine. 13 for a high in Vancouver. In Edmonton, looking at a high of five degrees. Now they could see periods of light snow ending in the morning and then clearing skies after that. In Calgary, seeing light snow ending around noon, high of three degrees. So as we get into the rest of the prairies, into Saskatoon, seeing a daytime high tomorrow of two degrees. Now Saskatoon could see uh, a chance of flurries there as well. Same thing for Regina, mixed with showers and flurries, four for a high there. And periods of uh, rain, they're ending in the afternoon in Winnipeg, high of eight degrees. Also a windy one also in the prairies. I should mention Regina and Saskatoon seeing 70k and 60k winds respectively. High of 10 degrees tomorrow in Toronto. Toronto expecting a lot of snow or rain rather five millimeters of rain. Clear skies in Ottawa and Montreal. High of 13 there in Ottawa. 12 degrees for high in Montreal. As we get into uh, the east coast here, Atlantic Canada. Fredericton sitting at a high of 11 degrees. Halifax looking at some showers. High of 8. 3 for high in Charlottetown seeing a mix of flurries and showers. And 10 degrees is where St. John's is tomorrow. Seeing showers or drizzle and a little bit cooler along the coast. More like 5 degrees there. So there you have it. That is your forecast. The inflation rate rose from 2.8% in February to 2.9% in March. Economists say it was mainly due to higher gas prices and higher costs for restaurant meals. Inflation, however, on groceries continued to slow, rising just 1.9%, and that's down from a peak of 11.4% in late 2022 and early 2023. Food inflation, including both groceries and restaurants, was running at about 3% in March. Housing starts were down 7% in March compared with the previous month. Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says the seasonally adjusted annual rate of new home construction was close to 242,200 units. That compares with a little over 260,000 units back in February. The actual housing starts year over year in March were 10% higher in Toronto and increased 15% in Vancouver because of an increase in multi-unit starts. Montreal's actual starts dipped 1%, dragged down by lower multi-unit starts. Well, it is tax season once again, and many of us are busy collecting documents and receipts needed to file our income tax returns for 2023. Financial expert Ken Prestige says it's very important to file when taxes are due, or you could face some pretty stiff financial penalties if you owe the government money. Uh, if you have a business, it's uh, June 15th, but for most people, it's April 30th. And uh, the penalties, uh, you want to file on time. Uh, if you're late filing, it's a 5% penalty on the amount of tax that you still owe. And also, if you're late filing for a whole month, each additional month, they add another 1% to it. And on top of that, uh, the compound interest uh, daily at 10% for this year. So you want to file on time, especially if you owe taxes. Get more valuable tax advice from Kent Prestige, owner of Prestige Consulting, as he chats with BCN's Jeanette Roche later in our broadcast. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 97 points on the day to finish at 21,642. The Dow was up 63 points to 37,798. The S&P 500 was down 10 on the day to 5,051, and the NASDAQ was down 19 points to 15,865. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down a nickel to 85.36 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 4 cents to $1.73 US. Gold was down 45 cents on the day to 23.82.89 US an ounce, and silver was down 77 cents to 28.11 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $8.57 per bushel, barley's at $6.44, canola's at $13.04, and corn is at $7.82 per bushel. Live cattle were up $1.20 to $1.8150, feeder cattle were up $0.80 cents to $2.4035, and lean hogs May contract was up $0.40 cents to $94.73. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to $72.32 US. Recapping one of our top stories, the Alberta government announced a funding increase for subsidized housing. It says a total of $75 million will be committed this year to 48 housing providers and $21 million of that is new money. 
Officials say more than 110,000 people live in more than 60,000 government-subsidized homes in our province. It says the demand has been growing as the cost of living continues to increase. Well, the federal budget came out today. Coming up, we'll receive some of the details and what they mean for you from federal political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly. He'll join us shortly from Toronto. Listen, when you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to check out our website anytime to see a number of local stories and interviews. The federal government tabled its budget on Tuesday. The parliamentary budget officer was anticipating a deficit of around $41 billion and apparently it won't be balanced for a number of years. Now to chat about this budget in more detail is political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly who joins us once again from Toronto. Brian, when it came to the budget, the federal government openly shared what would be in the budget over the past week or so. Were there any surprises left? Surprises on both the spending and the taxation side. We know this is a big spending government. They always put out projections, oh, we'll spend this much, and then they overshoot it. They spend more and more each year. Program spending is up $30 billion over last year. Last year, program expenses were $450 billion. This year, they're $480 billion. The deficit is going to be $25 billion more than they projected in last year's um, uh, budget over the coming five years. They're just, instead of the budget deficit going down, it's going back up again. And then you've got the interest charges on the deficit. This is the one I always say, it's like paying just a uh, monthly minimum on your credit card, $54 billion this year. That's more than the federal government sends to the provinces and territories for healthcare. And it's more than they collect in the GST how. So that's the spending side. It's crazy. They claim they're going to pay for this by increasing the capital gains tax. Uh, from 50% inclusion to 66% for corporations on any capital gain. And they'll do that the same for any individual making 250,000 in capital gains. That's gonna really hit businesses, business owners, small, medium, large. They're just gonna stop investing in Canada because the reward won't be there. Uh, they claim it's gonna bring in six and a half billion this year, 20 billion over the next four years. I don't think they're gonna meet those targets. And I think it's going to really hurt the economy. This is not a budget built to get the Canadian economy back on track. Brian, Stats Canada recently released the latest inflation number. Now, it came up slightly to 2.9%. What does that really mean when it comes to the key lending rate from the Bank of Canada? Will it remain status quo at 5% or could we potentially see another increase? Uh, you know, what most of us are hoping for is a rate cut. And of course, you've got politicians across the country saying it's time for a rate cut. Like this is hurting the housing sector. This is hurting uh, small businesses. It's hurting people renewing their mortgages. And between the excess spending in this federal budget and this inflation rate bouncing up to 2.9 percent, mortgage uh, index uh, up at 25 percent uh, year over year, rent increasing 8.5% year over year. This does not bode well. And the Bank of Canada made it clear that they need to be sure that in, uh, inflation is under control before they start cutting rates again. The fact that, yeah, it's only 2.9%, uh, but you know, food for restaurants, that's up 5.1%. Food that you and I buy, it's down to one9 but food overall is up 3%. You've got all these other key components that are still higher than where the Bank of Canada wants to see inflation before they do a rate cut. So you combine all of that with this inflationary spending that's in the budget, and I don't see them cutting the rate in June, maybe September, but that becomes a maybe at this point. I, I think we're in a wait and see holding pattern. I don't expect a rate increase, but don't expect that much anticipated, much desired cut to happen. Alberta Premier Daniel Smith is looking at legislation to stop the Trudeau government from striking deals with municipalities and spending in areas of provincial jurisdiction. Now, Quebec is on Alberta's side, but Brian, not so much with Doug Ford in Ontario. Why not? It comes down to how governments are perceived here. You know, in different parts of the country, having lived and worked across the country, I can tell you there's a different perception of Ottawa in Quebec than in Ontario. There's a different perception in Alberta. In Alberta and Quebec, they're very similar in some ways, politically, very different in others. But when it comes to the relationship with the federal government, they're both a bit antagonistic. And the population is as well. It's not just the political leaders. 
And, and so Danielle Smith can say, we're going to do this. I wouldn't be surprised if Scott Moe does something similar. It used to be that all of the premiers would say, no, no, stay out of our jurisdiction. In Ontario, the, the consensus appears to be among voters, we don't care who does it, just do it. And they want to see all governments acting in all areas. It makes no sense to me. It would be like Doug Ford deciding, well, I'm going to increase spending on the military since Justin Trudeau won't, and I'll raise an Ontario regiment, and we'll buy helicopters and tanks. You know, you, you would look at, you know, the Ford government tried that, or the Danielle Smith government tried that. People would look and say, that's crazy. But the Trudeau government, they're obsessed with spending in provincial uh, jurisdiction areas. The Bloc Quebec wall was up on their, their hind legs, and rightly so, in a question period earlier this week, asking about this and saying, your housing plan underfunds us, and it doesn't spend in the areas that we want. You, can, you need to stay out of Quebec's jurisdiction. The Legault government feels much the same way, but there are certain areas of the country, I would say Manitoba, Ontario, parts of Atlantic Canada, where, um, okay, spend it on provincial jurisdiction. We don't know the difference and we don't really care is kind of the ethos. Yeah, you know, Alberta Premier Daniel Smith keeps telling Justin Trudeau, stay in your lane. That seems to be a common theme here in the province. Now, the Trudeau government, Brian, rebranded the carbon tax rebate, which is going out to various Canadian households. I'm still waiting to get mine here. Now, you say they're fighting with banks over how it's being described in our online statements. Tell me more. Yeah, you pull up your, uh, your bank statement on your phone or your computer and you, you'll see debits and credits. And I don't know about you, but my bank, I, I sometimes look at something that went out, the, out of the account and I say, well, what's that? Or something comes in and, okay, I'm not sure. They don't have the best system for labeling everything. And the Trudeau government's frustrated that when the carbon tax or, or Canadian carbon rebate, I think is what they're calling it, when it shows up, they want that to be what shows up on the line because they want it for marketing purposes. They want you to feel good about the carbon tax and not many Canadians do right now, let me tell you. And, and so some of the banks have said, yes, we'll do it. Others are saying it's gonna take a while and others are saying, we don't have to do this for you. It really is the federal government trying to use the banks as part of their marketing scheme. You know, Jean Chrétien was famous for sending Canadians checks, but he made sure it was checks back in the day because, well, back then we didn't have direct deposit in quite the way we do now. But also, you get a little check with the Government of Canada logo and the Maple Leaf showing up, and you're like, oh, hoo -hoo, money from the government, and you feel good about the government. It worked for him. Trudeau's hoping that the carbon tax rebate works that way for him, and so far it's not, and part of it is, it shows up in your account and people look at their phone and say, oh, we've got 180 bucks. Uh, I don't know what that's for. Okay, let's spend it. <laughs> Brian, there's word now that NDP leader Jagmeet Singh may no longer be in full support of the carbon tax, especially when it comes to the levy being added to our natural gas bills. He's more in support, I guess, of commercial enterprises. Could he potentially pull his support on the coalition with the Liberals that we may see a non-confidence vote and potentially head to the polls sooner than October of next year? I don't think so for a moment. Look, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP voted for the Conservative motion uh, demanding that the, um, the, the Prime Minister hold a First Minister's meeting, televised First Minister's meeting, on the issue of the carbon tax. Um, they did that because they're getting pressure from their own voters who aren't happy with the carbon tax. You've got premiers like Wab Canoe in Manitoba who want rid of the carbon tax, and he's a new Democrat. And, and so they're feeling a bit of the pinch. So they voted for that. And then there was a, a couple of stories saying, oh, they're walking away from support of the carbon tax. And Jagmeet Singh quickly ran to the microphones to say, oh, no, 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 we're still all in favor of it. Um, the, the NDP, look, said earlier, you know, a, a budget written in orange ink. That's what this Trudeau budget is. It's written in orange ink. They have given the NDP what they wanted. Why would he pull the plug? I, I'm starting to wonder if Jagmeet Singh's not the real prime minister and Justin Trudeau is the figurehead. Uh, you know, I'm only partly joking at that point. But the the, the NDP, the, this is as good as it's going to get for them, despite the fact that the liberal support is dropping and conservatives are doing well. Normally, for the conservatives to do well and be threatening to win an election, the NDP needs to be strong. The NDP is not strong right now, not in any poll, despite the liberals... Uh, you know, falling apart. The Conservatives are eating all that support. Uh, it's not going to get better if Jagmeet Singh pulls the plug and goes to an election now.
Did you potentially see Jagmeet Singh losing his seat in the next federal election? Because a lot of insiders within the NDP that I talked to are not happy with the fact that he's not acting like an opposition leader. Well, you remember a, a week or so ago, there were three New Democrat MPs that announced on the same day that they wouldn't be running in the, in the next election. Um, so Carol Hughes, uh, Rachel Blaney, Charlie Angus all said on the same day they're not running. That followed three other New Democrats who said they're not running in the next election. When your caucus is that small and six say they're not running, it, it, you've got to imagine that there are problems in the caucus. And part of it is there was a big caucus meeting before those three announced about how close they are to the Liberals, that it's not helping them, that Jagmeet Singh is going out there denouncing the Liberal government on a daily basis, saying how awful they are, and then turning around and propping them up and voting for them. And it's annoying a lot of New Democrat voters who say that they are too close to the Liberals. Uh, it, and, you know, if you talk to Dippers, what's their big slogan? Liberal Tory, same old story. They see Justin Trudeau as if he's Pierre Polyev. You know, and, and you and I look at Justin Trudeau and say, he's going to the left of the New, New Democrats. It's not helping the NDP. So I, I, I could see Singh losing his seat, absolutely. And, and I could also see uh, the NDP losing far more than just his seat, but many seats across the country. We'll, we'll have to wait until a, a campaign uh, comes along. You know, my three uh, sayings about politics, uh, voters are fickle, polls can change, campaigns matter. <laughs> That's very true. Brian, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau recently testified at the Foreign Interference Inquiry. Now, you wrote that he was saying one thing under oath and another when questioned by the media. Can you explain? So there were two big things that came out of his testimony. One was he doesn't read his national security briefings. He was asked several times about different briefings. He was asked about details uh, in memos that were sent to him. And he would say, well, I didn't read that. Well, why not? I prefer verbal briefings. Uh, I, you know, the best way to get uh, this to me is to have someone tell me what's happening. Don't send me a memo. I may not have the time to read, he said. Multiple times this came up. And then when he was asked about that by a reporter on Friday, they said, are you going to start reading your briefing notes now? He, he said, I read everything. Well, what is it? You, you either don't read what you testified to under oath, or you read everything, which is what you're saying when the cameras are rolling, uh, when the media is there. It can't be both. And, and yet he wants you to believe it is both. And the other thing was, he said, uh, he, he undermined CSIS repeatedly. He talked about how their evidence wasn't credible. You, you couldn't take what they said at face value, that you had to interpret all of these things. And then, again, asked by the media, do you have faith in CSIS? Oh, I have absolute trust and faith in CSIS. Uh, you can't spend your whole time undermining them and then say you have faith in them. But his two objectives going into testifying, one, give himself plausible deniability. Deny that you saw these things. Deny that anyone told them to you. Therefore, you didn't have to act. Two, undermine CSIS as a credible source. And he accomplished both of those. Following Iran's attack on Israel this past weekend, there are renewed calls to name Iran's Revolutionary Guard or the Islamic Republic a terrorist entity. Brian, is Ottawa any closer to doing that? They've been under pressure to do this for years. And as recently as January, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was saying, we're actively examining it. Well, I don't know how long you need to actively examine it. We are now uh, in mid-April. Over the weekend, it was the Re uh, uh, Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps that launched these attacks against Israel. We know that they have been funding Hezbollah. Um, Iran says that their strike on Israel was in retaliation for Israel taking out a, a top general who's the Hezbollah liaison, who was meeting with them in Syria to plot the attacks of Hezbollah from Lebanon into Israel. We know that Iran funded and trained Hamas for the attacks on October 7th. We know that they fund terrorism around the world, and yet the Trudeau government won't do it. Now, they claim there's a, a, um, a, a portion of the Revolutionary Guard Corps where there's conscription, and they don't want to get people who are just forced to, to serve labeled as terrorists. It, you can still label the organization a terrorist entity. You can still impose greater sanctions. But they seem incredibly reluctant to do so, and I, I don't understand it. But you know, I'm puzzled by a lot of the Trudeau foreign policy, uh, an arms embargo against Israel at a time when it needs arms to defend itself. Um, 
Melanie Jolie uh, telling Israel, take the win uh, over the, the attack on the weekend, meaning they didn't hit that many things. So just don't retaliate against a, a country that just launched hundreds and hundreds of you know, UAVs and drones and missiles into your uh, territory. Uh, these guys puzzle me to no end how. So, Brian, let me ask you something. Where does the Trudeau government stand when it comes to support for Israel right now? I, you know, just lick your finger, stick it up in the air, wherever the wind is blowing, but it's not with Israel. Uh, I, I rolled my eyes when I saw Justin Trudeau put out a statement on the weekend saying, we stand with Israel. No, no, you do not. I think the Canadian people do, but I do not think that Trudeau does. There's a great piece in the Wall Street Journal the other day. They saw the actual original communique from the G7 leaders who met on the weekend discussing Iran's attack, and they compared it to what came out. And it was a severely watered-down statement compared to what the Biden administration had wanted to put out. And the reason is, according to the Wall Street Journal, Canada and Japan helped water it down. They said, oh, no, you can't be so strident in your support for Israel. You can't condemn Iran that strongly. This, again, I don't know where this government is going, except it, basically you have to look at diaspora politics and you have to look at uh, where are large crowds gathering that the Trudeau government hopes to get votes for. Well, a lot of that are the people who are cheering on Iran, as we saw happen in Toronto right after the attacks happened. There were cheers that went up in the crowds of the pro-Hamas protesters that were out in the streets. There were people... Uh, pledging allegiance to Hamas in Montreal uh, just the other day. You know, the, Trudeau's hoping for votes from these areas, and so he doesn't want to be too strong. It's, it's really disheartening. Political reporter and Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Hal. Well, it's hard to believe, but tax season is here once again already. And almost inevitably, there will be changes from last year, but it won't make things any less confusing. Today's guest has some advice on how to prepare your taxes and hopefully save some money along the way. Kent Prestige has decades of experience preparing taxes. He is the owner of Prestige Consulting and is also an instructor at Reeves College in Lethbridge. Uh, great to have you on again with us, Kent. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so first off, when do personal taxes need to be filed and what is the penalty if you end up filing late? Well, uh, April 30th for most people. Uh, if you have a business, it's uh, June 15th. But for most people, it's April 30th. And uh, the penalties, uh, you want to file on time. Uh, if you're late filing, it's a 5% penalty on the amount of tax that you still owe. And also, if you're late filing for a whole month, each additional month, they add another 1% to it. And on top of that, uh, the compound interest uh, daily at 10% for this year. So you want to file on time, especially if you owe taxes. Yeah, uh, yeah I was just going to say, and those fines are for if you are owing, if you're getting money back, uh, there's not a penalty. Right? There, there's no fine if you're getting money back, uh, except for, you know, you'd rather have your money in your hands right now, I would yeah. assume. The sooner yeah. the better, right? Make some That's summer right. plans with it. <laughs> Why exactly. not? Exactly. Okay, yeah. so Kent, many people today just use tax software to file their tax returns. So um, sometimes it might be worth hiring a tax professional, though, to do the preparation. So why is that? Well, um, I'll just tell you a little story here. I had a client one time who bought his own uh, tax software and he filed his own tax returns. And then just for fun, he said, I want you to file, I want you to do my tax return for me. And I got $1,500 back more for him than he uh, did on his own. And the difference was he didn't know what to claim. He didn't know what some of his exemptions were, didn't know what some of the credits were that he could claim, and he missed things. And uh, it was actually $1,500 difference. So uh, uh, he was client for quite a few years. He then moved away. So uh, okay. he's not my client anymore. But uh, certainly it does tell you that uh, you really, software is great. It'll do the math for you and it'll remind you about some things. 
but you still have to have a body of knowledge uh, behind you so you know what to cl uh, what to claim. Yeah, that was a good lesson for him, definitely, and, and for our viewers as well. Uh, so Kent, ever since the COVID pandemic, there have been a lot more people working from home, and up until now, the CRA had a simplified method simplified method of yeah. claiming home office expenses, but things have changed this year. So can maybe you explain a little bit of, about what these changes are? Sure. So the uh, simplified method was uh, if you were working at home during the, the pandemic, uh, you were allowed to claim $2 a day up to a maximum of $500 um, uh, for home expenses while you were uh, working from home. Uh, this year, they did away with that. They went back to basically the old way that you would normally have had to have claimed those expenses. Uh, you'd have to have the company that you work for sign a 20, uh, 2200 a form, a T2200. And that form is, um, it allows you to claim expenses for working from home. Then now you have to keep track of all of your expenses. So Let's say you set aside an office and it's 10% of your home, which is quite typical. Most people would take a bedroom and set it up as an office. And that's usually about 10% of your home. So you can claim 10% of your utilities, 10% of your interest, 10% of fire insurance and any expenses that have to do with your home. You can also claim uh, a cell phone and other expenses like that. But again, now you have to have records to prove all of these expenses, whereas last year it was just uh, two dollars a day, five hundred dollars, no matter what uh, you claimed as expenses. Right, exactly. Okay, now I understand that there is an opportunity for first-time home buyers with the first home savings account to save for a, a down payment. Yeah, actually, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, it's very similar to an RRSP. Uh, you can put up to eight thousand dollars a year into this home, this first homes uh, program, and up to a maximum of forty thousand uh, dollars. If you take that money, well, so it's sheltered from tax, so you don't pay tax on it while it's in there. When you take it out, if you buy a house with it, you don't have to pay tax on that money at all, which is a really good deal, forty thousand uh, dollars. Uh, you know, with no tax on it at all. So that's a pretty good deal uh, for a first time homeowner. Yeah. And it's such a great way to save as well. Exactly. Wonderful. You're saving on the tax as well as uh, saving for a house. Exactly. A kind of a win win there, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. So are there, are there potential tax implications when you buy or sell a home? Speaking of home buying. Yeah, there's there's some new ones that have just come out here. Like uh, if you uh, live in your house and you sell your house, there's no tax on that, at least currently. The liberals may change that. But at this point, there's no tax when you sell your the house that you live in. But they're bringing in new rules against anti-flipping, uh, where people will buy a house, they'll renovate it, uh, and then they'll sell it. Now, you used to be able to claim the income that you would make on that as a capital gain. Well, capital gains tax treatment is better than regular income tax treatment. Uh, now there's, if you if you own a house for less than a year, it's gonna be treated as income, which is taxed at a higher rate. Uh, so they're trying to, uh, you know, discourage people from buying a house and flipping it. Although it's still a great way to make money, it's just not quite as good as it used to be. Oh yeah, that's too bad for sure. Yeah. So any tax advice then to landlords who rent out their basement or rent out another house? Okay. So first bit of tax that I usually tell somebody that's renting either a part of their home or, or renting a house or anything like that is uh, don't take depreciation or it's called capital cost allowance on it um, for tax purposes. Uh, because what happens is when you sell a house, typically in the future, uh, you're going to make a capital gain on it, which may bump up your, your tax bracket already by doing that. And then most houses don't lose value. They gain value for the most part. There are situations where they might lose money, but for the most part, they gain money. So then you have to reclaim all of that depreciation that you've taken over the years. When you reclaim it, it's taxed as regular income. So it could put you in a really... Um, 
serious tax situation, we'll say, uh, if, if you uh, do that. So that's the first thing. Second thing that I want to talk about when it comes to renting out a house, make sure you claim all your expenses. Uh, you're allowed to claim your the property tax that you pay. You're allowed to uh, claim any of the expenses that are legitimately towards the house. Uh, so make sure you claim them. I've had people forget about their insurance or something like that. And so you give them a phone call, remind them, and then they have to go search for it. But the fact is, claim the expenses that you're allowed to, to keep your income as low as possible. Okay, great advice there. Uh, let's talk about charitable tax donations. How beneficial is this? How much, how much would it save on your taxes? Uh, uh, actually, probably one of the best things that you can do is, is uh, donate to a charity when it comes to tax treatment. Um, the only thing that's maybe better than that is if you donate to a political party, but the, the politicians take care of themselves. But for a, a standard donation to a charitable um, uh, institution, a church or something like that, uh, the first $200, uh, you're going to get a 15% uh, tax write-off on that. But anything over that, it, it jumps up exponentially. For example, um, anything over $200 automatically goes to 39%. And if you were, and then if you get into the really high brackets, uh, you can actually get, uh, um, I sorry, it goes to 29%. If you get into the higher tax brackets, it could go to 33%. Um, so anything over $200 at the 29% rate, you may not even be paying 29% because you're not in that marginal tax bracket. So there's actually a, a, a really good uh, advantage to giving to charity. Mm, yeah, no kidding. Um, we were talking about uh, write-off expenses before about how, so what about childcare? Can we deduct childcare expenses from our income? Certainly can, okay. uh, yep. And it, it's a, a very good uh, write-off. So again, if you're paying um, a, a daycare or, or something like that, make sure you keep your receipts. Uh, make sure you turn them into your accountant so that they can claim it on your tax return as well. Okay. How about moving expenses? Moving expenses, yes. With some uh, caveats there, uh, you have to move for business and uh, pretty well you have to move out of town. You have to move to another town. But if you do move, again, make sure you keep all of your receipts. And not just for the moving company, make sure you keep uh, kilometers for the trip that you did in your own personal car because you can claim that. If you have to stay in a hotel, make sure you claim the hotel bills. All of those type of expenses uh, can be claimed. And again, that's going to reduce uh, your taxes for that year. But it has to be a move for business. Right. Oh, great advice there. Okay. So, Kent, is it worth keeping medical bills to cl claim as a deduction? Well, the deal on medical bills is um, you can claim anything over 3% of your income. So, there's this uh, limit on it. So, for example, if you I'll just calculate, say you made $50,000 uh, times point you would have to have more than $1,500 worth of um, um, tax receipts before you could claim anything. So for the average person, you know, $1,500 worth of medical expenses is, is quite a bit. Um, but again, if you are a senior, then it's well worthwhile, um, you know, keeping them because your income's lower, eh? So again, it depends on your income. It's 3% of your income, whatever your income is. So you want to make sure that, uh, um, you know, but keep them. If, you know, if you buy glasses, a pair of glasses right now could be $800, right? Exactly. And you never know what what other expenses and, might come yeah, up during the year. Yeah, it could really add up to that. And I mean, before you know it. There you, there you go. And by the way, Kent, how long should a person maybe hang on to their tax documents for? Well, legally, you're required to hang on to them for six years, but you also need to keep your current years. So it's really seven years, uh, and then you can throw out uh, anything. But the other thing about taxes is actually your, your tax returns are statute barred after three years, which means 
Uh, Revenue Canada can't open up a tax return that's more than three years old unless you ask them to. So if you ask them to open it up or if they find find that you've done something illegal, then they can open up uh, going back further. But really, for the most part, uh, you know, uh, they're not going to go back more than three years. Okay. What advice do you have for someone thinking about investing in an RRSP or a TFSA? Well, um, first of all, balance the amount between the two. Um, I used to be really a real promoter of RRSPs until I went to a senior's home and talked to some of the seniors that were in there, and they had subsidized rent in this particular senior's home. So as soon as you claim, as soon as you take money out of an RRSP, it becomes taxable income, and in that case, it raised their rent. So these guys, right off the bat, a third of it was going in tax. Then a third of it would uh, their, their was increasing their rent. So in the end, they didn't like RRSPs at all. But that's a rare case. For most people, an RRSP is good. What you have to remember is that it defers tax. It doesn't eliminate tax. You pay the tax, you just pay it down the road. On the TFSA, what I love about a TFSA is that Uh, You put money away, you don't get a tax bump right at the beginning, but any money that's earned in the fund is tax free. And when you take the money out of the fund, um, uh, it's not going to affect your taxable income. So again, if you're a senior, you take some money out of your TFSA, it doesn't increase your taxable income. If it doesn't increase your taxable income, it doesn't affect things like the GIS uh, or your OAS or any of the other pensions that you might be receiving. So, so there's a benefit pay, you, to both you, of them. You either pay now or pay later, depending on what you Yeah, it's sort of like the old uh, car commercial where they talked about an oil filter. You can either pay me now or pay me later, right. uh, but way, you're going to pay, pay taxes. The only <laughs> only things in life that are for sure are death and taxes, right? So Exactly. Okay, so if a person normally receives money back from the government after filing taxes, I understand that you can request a a reduction in the tax withheld from your pay so that you can have less taxes deducted from your paycheck the following year. Yeah, this is really true, and it it, it certainly applies to um, people who are very charitable. They give a lot of money away. Um, So what you can do is after you've donated quite heavily for a year, Uh, Revenue Canada then has a record that you're a regular donor. Uh, And so you can send them a letter in year two and say, I'd like to reduce my taxes at source based on the charitable giving that I do. They will then send a letter that you give to your employer and your employer can reduce your taxes at source rather than having to wait for a whole year to get that tax return. So, wow. Uh, lots of advice there, lots of great advice, and lots to think about for sure, especially during this tax season as we're all thinking about getting our, our taxes filed. Kent, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Kent Prestage is the owner of Prestige Consulting and is also an instructor at Reeves College in Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks so much for watching.